Jalen Hurts, second round draft pick for the Philadelphia Eagles. Want to make his first start. We could kind of see this coming after the Carson Wentz debacle last week where he got pulled against the Green Bay Packers. I don't know if I could have seen this coming at the start of the season, but maybe our next guest, maybe he could have the author of this piece. Jason Reed, senior writer for ESPN's The Undefeated. Jay Reed, great to have you on with us. I'll start you off with the question. Did you see this coming before the start of the season? No, my man, I, I, I actually did not. Uh, you know, Carson Wentz signed a massive contract not too long ago, and he had a great year last year leading the Eagles to the playoffs when they were decimated. The receiving corps was just off, well, not awful, but the, the guys that they were expecting were, were injured, and he did it with guys off the practice squad. So I, I really was not expecting this at all, but Wentz has had a horrible season. I mean, it's well documented, and the Eagles are trying something different. They drafted Jalen Hurts in the second round, so with, with the season they're having, I believe 3-8-1 and one right now, um, even in the NFC East, it doesn't look like they're going to win the division. The NFC East is not very good, as most people know. So um, they're trying to shake it up in Philly, and Jalen Hurts is going to get a shot. Jason, something I hadn't thought about until I read your story in The Undefeated was the Eagles really have a tradition, probably a strong tradition as you find in the NFL, of black quarterbacks. Randall Cunningham, Donovan McNabb, Rodney Pete, Michael Vick, and now Jalen Hurts steps into that, that, that lineage. Um, was there a reason that you found that, that they seem to be more prone to, to utilizing black quarterbacks than most franchises in the NFL? Well, you know, Jay, I mean, Andy Reid was coming to the cookout for a while. Uh, you know, a Andy, Andy drafted Donovan <laughs> McNabb, you know, back, back, back in 99. He made him the second overall pick in the draft. He had, he had a great deal of success with Donovan. Uh, he, he then, Donovan kind of helped convince Andy to bring in Michael Vick after Mike had the, the, the situation he had occurred. And he, he was uh, in prison for, for 18 months. Um, and then Michael Vick had a great deal of success succeeding Donovan. He was a comeback, NFL comeback player of the year. So I think a lot of it has been Andy Reid when he was in Philly determining that not because of Donovan's race or not because of Michael Vick's race, but he looked at these guys as guys who could help them win. And, and I, I think so those two situations really are directly related to Andy Reid. The Randall Cunningham situation, you know, Randall was a second-round draft pick out of UNLV, Nevada, Las Vegas. He, he came in there after Ron Jaworski, and, you know, he, they, he didn't start right away. But then he, he, because of his incredible athleticism, he showed what he could do, and he, he was dubbed the ultimate weapon, and he had a good run there. You know, Rodney Pete uh, succeeded Randall when Randall's last year in Philly before he retired. Randall uh, wasn't, you know, wasn't at the same level in terms of his athleticism. Rodney Pete took over the job. He, he, he became the starter and led him to the playoffs, and actually led him to a playoff victory, too. So, you know, that was in a different era. But, but I think when you look at Philadelphia – has it has it been a conscious decision to do this with black quarterbacks? No, I, I think in each case, there the talent is what won out. It wasn't like anybody was trying to make any social statement or whatever. It just so happened that this one franchise has had a great run with African American quarterbacks. You mentioned uh, Rodney Pete, a, a former Detroit Lion, when I actually rooted for the Lions, and I think they beat the Lions fifty six to thirty seven uh, in the playoffs in the game where Scott Mitchell, when he got pulled, asked the coach why when they were down like 30-some points. But I, I've quit the Lions, as you can tell. I'm, I'm Lions free. I quit them in January of 1999. I am curious, though, Jay Reed, that when I look at Jalen Hurts and I look at his college career, he was at Alabama and was pulled for Tua. He was at Oklahoma where he, it seemed like they were kind of held back by his shortcomings. Does he have the tools, the arm strength, to really be able to maximize what Philadelphia does have to make himself a viable starting quarterback, not just for now, but in the long term. Well, you know, my man, I'll tell you, he, he, was, the, he was a Heisman Trophy finalist at Oklahoma. He, he had a very good run at, at Alabama. He actually came off the bench to help them get in the position to win the national championship after relieving Tua. So I think when you look at him and when you look at what he did in college, clearly the Eagles were hired him. I mean, taking somebody in the second round, he was the 53rd overall pick. When you know, when you look at the at all the rounds in the NFL draft, 
Philadelphia identified him as a guy who could play. He wasn't a first round pick, but second round is still a high round pick when you're a 53rd overall player taken in the draft. So yeah, I, I definitely think that the, the skill set is there for him to succeed. Now, is he going to come in here in the last four games and 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 just wow the Eagles to the point where they're going to take the cap hit that they would incur to get rid of Carson Wentz uh, after what Carson Wentz has done uh, and all the things that would go into making that type of mind on the ship? I don't know. He's going to have to show a lot to get that done, but he has to get started first, and that's what this Sunday is, a start. All right, Jason, I'm going to ask you to, to switch hats for a moment and go back in time to when me and you were at the press box of Dodger Stadium. You were, you were a Dodger beat writer. I want you to get in baseball mode for a moment. Jason has experience. Jason covered the L.A. Clippers. He covered the Dodgers, um, moved to Washington, covered the football team there. So, so Jason has a wide background. Sounds like he's covered some losing but franchises. I, I want to share with you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he, he's a winner, though. Jason's a winner. <laughs> uh, but but he, he, this was my hot take of 2020 as, as I watched and as I enjoyed watching the, the Dodgers win the championship um, led by Mookie Betts. Believe it or not, Mookie Betts represents what is wrong with baseball. Believe it or not. And it has nothing to do with him. And it's not a negative statement on him. But A, there should be more of him, right? There's no reason that we couldn't have more African-Americans playing baseball, more African-Americans of him. Who, he's not LeBron James. He's, yet, he's not a unique physical specimen, right? He's just maximized his talents. But he's not one of the most gifted athletes that we've seen. So we could replicate that. There should be more of him. And there should be more um, teams that could afford him. It, it's a shame that the Dodgers were really the only team that could afford him, even though they had a great roster, MVP on the roster as it existed, Cy Young Award winners. But um, the Boston Red Sox said we can't afford him as, as, as lucrative a franchise as that's been. So the fact that there's only one Mookie Betts, that there's only maybe one or two franchises that can afford a Mookie Betts, it's just a bad reflection of baseball to me that represents everything that is bad about baseball. What, what do you see when you see Mookie Betts? Well, you know, Jay, the, there's been a problem in Major League Baseball with, you know, attracting African-American talent for, for quite some time now. You know, we, we, we look at, you know, we, we talked about the, uh, the RBI program, or reviving baseball in inner cities. You know, and, and the idea was you know, start building fields in inner cities and getting more black kids playing the sport. Because, I mean, you know, back in the back in the day, you know, back after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in baseball, I mean, African-Americans you know, flocked to baseball in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And, you know, people talked yeah. about and, and the, the popularity in the 70s. They were, exactly. You know, exactly. Now, people talk about the popularity of the NBA coinciding with with the with the decline of African American interest in baseball. You know, when I when I see Mookie Betts, I see a very talented athlete. I see a, a great baseball player, but it's it it's not like you look at Mookie Betts and Mookie Betts is not LeBron James. Like, you know, when I when I look at LeBron James, if, if I try to draw a comparison with the NBA, LeBron James is is a physical freak that he can do the things at 250 pounds and 6'8 with, with his right. with his ability to handle the ball and his vision. So like Mookie Betts is a great athlete, don't get me wrong, but there there are it's not like Mookie Betts is such an outlier that you can't find a guy like this. He's not the Greek freak, uh, you know, another right. another uh, basketball comparison. So you know, baseball still has a problem with, with attracting African Americans to want to play that game. You know, the, the NFL doesn't have that problem. The NBA doesn't have that problem. And as far as affording him, look, I, I uh, tweeted during the World Series, people, can someone please explain to me why the Red Sox couldn't afford Mookie Betts? I don't buy that. I mean, I don't buy that they could not <laughs> have found a way to retain him. Now, they, they made a business decision not to do it and, you know, you know, benefit of the Dodgers, obviously. But yeah, there's a lot going on in what you just said there. But I think the core of it is baseball can, has to continue to do a better job of attracting young African American athletes to want to play that game and want to invest in that game over the NBA and o over the NFL. And, you know, it's so specialized now, fellas, you, as you know, I mean, like my son plays, plays uh, travel baseball and like, I don't we don't see black kids on any other teams when we're going to these tournaments in Pennsylvania and around. Mm. So and you have to invest 
in in basically one sport. It's not like when, you know, Jay, when you and I were, you know, kids. I mean, I know Vinny's a little younger than us, but it's not like when you and I were kids. Now you invest in one sport. You got to get the hitting coaching. You got to be down with doing that nonstop. So there's a lot to what you said. I agree with what you said. I don't know the answer, but I do know this much. The core of it is baseball has to do a better job attracting black athletes. I don't know if they will. I don't know if that's, you know, what you look at the MLB academies and everything else, like they're putting their money in other places. So I'm not sure if it's as much of a priority for them. Like, like you said, it's not, to me, it's not so much about what they're not bringing to football. I think football, especially with CTE and some of these other things, like there's an opening there. And it's not just going to be the NBA that's going to take advantage of that because not everybody can grow to be 6'3", 6'4". You know, baseball, you can be a little bit on, I don't say minute, but you can be under 6 feet, around 6 feet, and have a greater chance of success there. And I think it just has to be, to me, I think you pointed it out, Jay, it has to be the end of specialization. Yeah, I, I mean, it, the reality of it is, is that, that that it's so specialized now that kids, you know, if, if you're a youth basketball player and you know you got a shot to get recruited, and and you know, I'm not talking about you know going straight from you know one you know one and done, but just recruited and and playing college ball, then yeah, you're going to focus on that. I remember JA real quick. Years ago, we were talking about this. Jay saw Ryan Howard somewhere. I don't know if everybody remembers Ryan Howard. He was a power hitting first baseman for the Philadelphia Phillies. And I'll never forget this. Jay, he either called me or texted me. He's like, man, I just saw Ryan Howard, man. Like, he's like not like any massive, you know, physical specimen. You know, no shade or disrespect. But the point he was <laughs> making to me was that right. you look at, you know, now Jay, Jay covered those Laker runs. You got, you got Shaq. You got the Diesel. You got Kobe. And, and the point he was making to me, and it's always stuck with me, is that. You look at Ryan Howard, man, this dude, like, there's something, go there's a difference here. And that difference is playing itself out more and more. Well, Jay, well, Jay you Reed, the, the, the spite, the point the out, spite, though, was like Ryan was Howard's say, contract. Oh, yeah. I was going to say that. Yeah, that, that <laughs> Ryan too. Howard's contract and Mookie Betts' contract, right? <laughs> Mookie Betts is getting like a third of a billion dollars. So if, if more maybe African-American youth sports participants saw those contracts, saw what could lie on the other end, maybe they'd be more interested and more invested. Does Jay, well, Jay Reed, despite your asinine LeBron, Michael Jordan opinions, <laughs> I'm glad to have you on. We are glad to have you on here today, man. We appreciate you. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you guys, too. We're going, we're going to bring you Good back on Reed. for a different conversation because LeBron wants all that 2016-2020, you know, extra credit. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, thanks for watching Brother from Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Peacock. Appreciate you.